mean, the thing about the teaching about birds for me is like, it's such an avenue for teaching about general concepts, bigger concepts that then you could tie back in to your gardening work, your, your, you know, you know, looking at insects, you know, any kind of work that you're doing. So I'm going to try to kind of go at it from that angle of teaching and using birds as an avenue for teaching larger ecological concepts. And then I wanted to try to touch on some specific birds that you might see commonly around the schoolyard or kids might see at home. So I have a little bit of that in there and really give a few ideas about activities or projects you could do with the kids to make it more applicable and hands-on and and do some um, personal observations for, you know, on part of the children and have them integrate that into their work. So I am going to um, screen share in a moment here and that way I can share my presentation with you. Um, hopefully I push the right buttons, there we go. So, um, so again, using birds as a way to teach larger concepts, um, but also giving lots of information about birds specifically, of course. Um, so I, I have a special fondness for ravens. So I included a raven on my top uh, picture there. And people often ask me, you know, how can you tell a raven from a crow? Well, they're much larger. They have a much heavier bill. Um, they do have a slightly different shaped wedge-like tail. Um, we tend to see them more in the winter and around my house in Malderboro than I do in the summertime, but um, periodically see them other times as well. So, you know, not all teachers are going to love birds, but as teachers, you, you have the fun chore of making everything exciting and wonderful and amazing. And, <laughs> and that way you sort of try to capture all your students' uh, attention. And, you know, it sort of becomes sometimes I'm afraid like, you know, uh, an, an infomercial for, for nature in this case. <laughs> but um, the thing about birds is they really are extraordinary. And they're extraordinary in the diversity. And I think kids can really glom on to some of those fun facts about how amazing they are sometimes. It's a good way to start off like that mallards can migrate at 55,000 feet where there's less oxygen and less resistance. They're higher than airplanes. And woodpeckers have tongues that can you know, they, the tongues wrap around the backside of their um, lower jaw and then attach via muscles to the top of their skull. Um, and they have special um, uh, sort of a shock absorbing muscles in, around the base of the beak so that when they're banging on things to excavate to eat their insects, they, they can uh, do that without getting a big headache. And chickadees brains grow in the winter and shrink in the summer to increase their memory capacity because they have to remember where they stored their food. Um, and peregrine falcons can dive at more than 250 miles an hour. Um, and some birds use tools like nuthatches. It's actually not the nuthatch around here or either of the nuthatches that are around here, but the brown headed nuthatch of out west that uses um, little bits of bark to prize up other bark uh, while it's looking for insects or green herons using bait when they look for fish, they'll take like a shiny beetle wing and drop it in the water. And that will attract a fish. And then, and we do have green herons here, although they're fairly secretive. And um, then when the fish comes up to eat the beetle, it, the bird will grab its, its dinner, the fish. So, um, you know, sometimes sharing some of those kinds of fun facts with the students is helpful. Um, and these kids might have their own stories about some cool thing they saw a bird do that they, and that might be a fun introduction, a way to think about what their personal experiences are with the birds. And then um, I often start with, or I almost always start my, you know, what makes a bird a bird kind of discussion with the kids because I'm never certain <laughs> if they all know precisely what a bird is and um, what what specifically is a bird and what are its characteristics. And that's a super important part to be able to differentiate a bird from an insect, from a mammal, from a reptile, that sort of thing. And to have the, that clarity in their minds about those different groups of organisms. So that all by itself. 
So a lot of times I start off just asking the kids, so what is a bird? How do you know one when you see one? And you might even draw it as you go. But um, the kids will tell you they have hollow bones, they have beaks and they have wings and um, they have crops and gizzards. I have actually very rarely had any children tell you that they have unilateral breathing, but that is something that's very cool about them. <laughs> and um, that they have feathers. And I challenge them to think of like, well, so what's unique about the bird that's something that other organisms do not have? And of course, you can go through all these things and say, well, squid have beaks and other animals have wings like insects and um, reptiles can do unilateral breathing and some and crocodiles and earthworms both have gizzards and um so you know and and you can talk about the hollow bones and if you actually if you bring a, even like a chicken bone or any kind of bird bone with you and show them they don't really have like hollow straw like bones for the most part um some of them will some like if you take the a small bone from a small bird um that will that is a you know migratory bird they they will have absolute hollow bones on occasion but a lot of bird bones within a bird are pneumatic which means they have like air sacs um or air not air sacs excuse me air um compartments so uh, there's compartments and then there's a, a framework of bone within the um within the larger bone structure itself so um Mammals have that too. And we have that like, for example, around our nasal cavity, around our sinuses and so forth. So you can get into some specifics because it's great for the kids to know, you know, well, not all the bones in every bird are totally hollow, although that is an aspect of them. Um, and in fact, things like um, loons, which are an ancient variety of bird, have um, fairly dense, heavy bones. And that is to help them dive, for example. So again, getting the kids to keep talking about this and kind of going through all these things. Um, and we can come back to the unilateral breathing, but one of the things that's special about birds and the way they respirate is that they have lungs, of course, but they also have these air sacs, uh, <clears throat> both anterior and posterior air sacs that fill with air. And as the bird is breathing and pulling in air through its um, nares, its nasal cavities and its beak sometimes, the the air is only going one direction. And, and it's actually, um, it fills not only the air sacs um, around the lungs, but it, um, but it also fills those um, compartments in the bone, uh, those pneumatic compartments. And so that is um, an aspect that helps the birds to be light. And um, it also helps the birds to be able to have air that's going one direction. And so unlike our breath, when our breath goes in and out, the air is going multiple directions out the same tube, <laughs> essentially. And so that helps the birds to be um, super athletic. Like if we had that kind of breathing, we could run a lot faster than we do. Um, so it's helping them to be able to extract oxygen and utilize it um, much more efficiently. And ultimately, what you get down to is what is making the birds unique from other organisms, and you get down to feathers, and they really are the defining characteristic. Um, yes, dinosaurs did have feathers, and of course, when we were children, that was not in any of the books, <laughs> but now it is. Um, and any good dinosaur book will show you the feathers um, with, long, uh, with, the, with the other images of the dinosaurs. So. Um, and you and talking about that connection between the group of theropods that dinosaurs that birds are descended from um archaeopteryx was the first bird and um th that's a that's a cool story for the kids to explore as well i'm not going to go too far into it but um it is it is pretty interesting and and you know most kids do like dinosaurs a lot um but so you get down to feathers because today feathers are unique among other organisms. There's no other group of organisms that has feathers. Um, and so kind of the moral of the story is that nature doesn't really invent new adaptations, but extremely rarely and builds upon existing ones. And even the story of, you know, well, so why, how did birds end up with hollow bones or pneumatic bones? It's, it's really because 
um, the dinosaurs had them because those huge dinosaurs could not have moved around. <laughs> Basically, they would have been too heavy to even move if they did not, and especially to move fast. And so those theropods were both um, needing to move because they were, some of them were hunters, many of them were hunters, um, and they and they were huge. And so they couldn't have moved around if they weren't um, light enough to do so and, and do so quickly. And so um, nature didn't really create a new adaptation with birds, but birds um, are adapted to today's environment um, and descended from the dinosaurs. So feel free to interject or make comments as we go. Um, so a lot of people like to begin with basic identification and that's a good place to start sometimes just so you can talk about the birds that you see or if you're having kids, um, for example, record birds or notice birds and they, you want them to start being able to make accurate observations and have the language to describe what they're seeing and hearing. So I do think that, um, you know, identification can be overblown because you can, you can, kind of go too far down that and you don't want to discourage people from trying to describe the birds. So I don't necessarily dwell on the names that the kids have to know names, for example, but being able to describe the bird is really helpful. And a lot of times, you know, when you see the bird out your window for a, just an instant, you know, you're just going to focus on what is the overall size and shape and behavior? what do you see it doing? What's the sort of first impression color? Um, beak shape, is it long and narrow, short and fat, that sort of thing. Um, and then teaching the kids to look for the details. What were the colors on the head? What were the colors um, on the tail? What's the length of tail compared to the bir other birds you've seen? What are the colors and stripes like on the wings? Was there an eye ring or not? Um, leg color, you know, and those things are really pretty detailed. So if you can get to that point, that's, you're doing great. <laughs> um, that's a lot. And I, I do sometimes um, with kids, you know, get them to learn some of the parts of the bird or try to, you know, you know, what's, where's the throat, where's the crown, that sort of thing. So they have a few terms to be able to um, use when they're describing birds to you. So that, and it's great, great vocabulary. Um, all that is readily available on the web. I also will make this presentation available to you. So if you particularly like this image, which I did take off the web, um, you, can, you can also use that. Um, so one of the first uh, places I go often with a group of kids with respect to birds is talking about, you know, how are they adapting? How are they surviving? Um, and, and this again is gonna be giving kids ways to describe there's a lot of language that can be developed with us um, you could really get into um, writing and reading and um, practicing new words and descriptive words are real they're key in science and so i could see um, people who are wanting to teach kids about that not only the observation which is part of it but just the language that goes into this um, is important so I do encourage the kids, whether you're looking at real live birds out the window or looking at birds um, in the woods or the garden, um, you know, to talk with you or identify, you know, is this a bird that's probing for insects? Is it walking? Is it flying? Is it perching? Um, how do you think it grabs its food? Um, is it drilling holes? And what is it using its it's especially um, the beak and the feet. What is it using those parts of its anatomy for? And of course you could make a worksheet. You could, um, one thing we've done with kids a lot is have um, teams and have pictures with different say beaks or different feet and ask the kids, all right, so what, what are they using? You know, put all the bird pictures. Let's say you have, you know, 25 pictures of birds and cut out from magazines put all the ones that are probably catching insects based on its beak type into a pile. All right, now find all the ones that are probably um, catching fish into another pile. And then go back and have conversations about why the kids thought that those birds would be able to do those things with those adaptations. Um, and so, and you could do that any number of ways, but, um, 
the the thing for the kids to understand is that the these appendages or these parts of the of their anatomy are they're basically like tools and the birds use them in order to survive so um, you're not going to use um, a hammer to um, cut a piece of wood you're going to use a saw and so you can think of the birds beaks the same way they're not going to use something it'd be impossible to survive if you had a long thin pointy beak and you're trying to collect seeds and eat them because you simply wouldn't be able to eat the seed. You wouldn't be able to crunch its hard outer covering and, and consume it. And so you need the right tool for the job. It's really important because, you know, you don't have enough calories. <laughs> You're going to be a dead bird. <laughs> um, so, so it's key. And, and over time, um, a, a bird's beak or its feet, for example, um, they will adapt. Those birds who, who survive the best because their um, beak or their foot is helping it to survive, those birds are going to be able to reproduce better. They're going to live longer and have more babies. And those birds that are not well adapted are not going to make it, um, or not going to make it as well, or not going to be able to reproduce as well. So um, you could take a group of kids and watch some birds and um, you know, out in the garden or in the woods or wherever, and not only talk about, you know, what bird are you looking at and what is it eating, but also what are the habits around the, the foraging? You know, is this a bird that flies down, scratches on the ground, seems to pick something up and flies to a branch and then does something with that food source? Or is this a bird that seems to grab its food and eat it and fly away completely? Um, you know, and what's, what is that, what are the advantages to that, those different behaviors? Um, and what are the, what are the um, aspects that are, that are not advantages, perhaps, they are more liabilities. So, um, can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, so do you have a, like a, sort of a loose, loose thoughts on age groups and, um, you know, the reason why I'm asking this question is because one of my biggest learning curves with what I do is that I'm constantly with different age children. And so like I have a better sense of some than others depending on my experience. But um, I'm just imagining I'm often, I often interact most frequently with K to four. Um, and just, <laughs> so I, Anyway, this, we don't need to get too sidetracked about this, but what I'm imagining is trying to make these observations that you're suggesting with a group yeah. of younger kids. And it's a little hard for me to imagine, practically speaking, how that would work. So do you have a way in which you usually do that? Do you spread them out? Do you have them, um, do you know what I'm asking? Does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah, I, I think I do. Yeah, I, I, you're right. I mean, so it, we do just like you i mean we also work with the different age groups and so we do modify um for different age, you know talking about the same subject matter but you know right. you're going to conduct yourself differently with the k through second grade than you are through the third and up crowd or whatever yeah um so that's a that's a good question so um and i am kind of purposely i've been talking about it sort of generally speaking because mm -hmm obviously everyone's going to tailor for their own teaching and for their own groups. And so that's a good question in this regard. Um, in general, for those younger groups like K first grade, you know, that crowd, you know, how do I, how do I specifically kind of get at this kind of activity? So um, with this group, I often, um, talk about it in a small, like in an introduction kind of a way. Um, so I am say talking about birds that they really know well, a robin, um, a mallard duck, that sort of thing, uh, maybe a woodpecker. Um, they're likely to be um, easily discernible and the kids are likely to know what I'm talking about to begin with. And um, so I might show, you know, three different pictures, the duck, the robin, and the woodpecker, and ask them, you know, look at the beaks on the duck. What's this going to be good for? How are, you know, how is this bird eating? What's it, what's it doing with its beak? Um, 
and then same with the other with the other birds. So that would be like an introductory way to kind of get at what you're talking about and using the term like tool, for example, when you're describing the beak and um, um, and then going out and, and as a group and watching one bird, you know, whatever it is, it's a starling or it's a, uh, you know, whatever bird you've got out. I don't know, what birds have you seen out in the garden? Um, well, I mean, that, that's the thing is, uh, <laughs> or a crow, for example, you know, right. I mean, it depends a little bit on the time of year. We actually see a lot of raptors sort of circling, um, more often than not, that's what catches kids attention. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, but so you I've might have a, oh, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, I've also just started to think about incorporating a little, like looking more closely at insects. So I am sort of thinking through like, how could I um, combine observing both of those things as a, and addressing a lot of these same things. Yep. Um, or concepts. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So same thing with insects, you know, have three different insect pictures, talking about what those adaptations are that help those animals survive. I mean, that, that's what we're getting at here. And I would, you know, it sounds like if you've got birds that you're seeing specifically at the garden, maybe have some, since not everyone's going to see that bird, you know, that raptor, five kids will look up, five kids are looking at the ground. So um, you could, I, I would just have some, if you're lucky. So, um, <laughs> so then go ahead and have some pictures and be like, that's a red tail hawk. Look, I happen to have a picture of a red tail hawk and I happen to have a picture of a crow and a robin and a duck or whatever it is um, for your site. And I would start off with a big group presentation style discussion and looking at those photos and then um, trying to find even just one bird to observe as a group, you know, so it's a crow walking around and maybe ultimately, you know, you're not gonna see it eat. That's, you know, how it goes. And so, um, that's the kind of thing that, so then I sort of turn it into, well, look, this is science. So, you know, we don't have time today to watch the crow all day long and we didn't see it eat. So, but we did see it walk, you know? And so what adaptations does it have for walking? Well, it has legs that walk <laughs> um, as compared to a duck. If a duck walked around all day long, that's not it's hard for them to do that or a loon with its legs in the back of its body. They have a hard time doing that. Not all birds walk, some hop. What's the advantages to hopping versus walking? And what are um, some disadvantages? So you could always take those, um, or you could turn it into a discussion about other adaptations. Crows are black, um, crows are big. Um, you know, so what are the, you, you often do have to take what you're given when you're outdoors and sort of say, okay, and that's part of why I went this avenue of, so what are these big topics, these bigger concepts that you want to involve the children in learning about, but, you know, you, when you're actually out there, and let's say you only see a crow that day, and you don't even see it do what you want it to do, <laughs> so you just have to make it into a more circular discussion about adaptations, about why they're black or why they're big. Some what are some disadvantages of being big and black? What are some advantages to being big and black? Um, and how to you know if there's if there's disadvantages um, to being big and black, for example, um, you know how does a b crow manage that? Um, so for example, they're a social animal and they're big and black, they're really obvious, but they're a social animal. So other, other, so cr the crows work together and they, and they communicate when there's a sign of danger and you might even see that sort of thing. Um, so that's, you know, in terms of the working this with the younger kids, that's where I would start is some pictures and some observations because they need the opportunity to develop those observation skills and they won't necessarily have that. And another thing about that is um, they will frequently be very short observation time periods because <laughs> you're, if you're lucky, you say, okay, everybody freeze. And some of it's just having those skills that we all are developing as teachers of being like, okay, I'm walking along and I'm in the ball field or whatever, you know, oh my gosh, there's a crow, everybody freeze, you know, and then everybody has to stay frozen and you kind of have to work your way up to that. Okay, every, look, we're gonna watch this crow and 
okay, reality is you're only going to watch a crow for 45 seconds if you're lucky, because everybody starts to shuffle around. But hopefully they all at least keep their eyes glued on the crow for 45 seconds. Well, that's that's magic for 45 seconds, and that's great. And then you have to walk on and okay, you know, I saw a robin over here. So we're going to walk over here and, oh, there's a robin, everybody freeze or whatever it is. Um, and and kind of develop some of those bird um, or any nature, you know, <laughs> outdoor um, techniques that work for you in terms of getting the kids to be animated and focused enough that they will focus f with you. Um, and then, um, making it um, as varied a experience as possible so that you know there's walking and then there's freezing and then there's walking and then there's sitting and listening and then there's maybe jumping up and down for a few minutes <laughs> and then there's more walking you know so there's those tricks of the trade um so uh yeah yeah so oh and here's just a diagram of the woodpecker tongue that i was mentioning before um so um, obviously with you know third and fourth graders and fifth graders even, this becomes easier. It's more in line with other work they probably have done in terms of studying nature. They may know very well what the word adaptation means, they may be able to tell you that from the beginning, um, to adapt, to change, that, you know, that whole bit. Does that kind of get at your thinking? So um, part of this whole adaptation thing is that the birds around here have to survive multiple seasons and winter in particular is really stressful. It's a really cool time to focus on birds because we can talk about how birds survive the winter. Um, so some birds migrate, some adapt. And, um, and I'm talking about their behavior now. So it's great for the kids to know, you know, before we were focused on the physical characteristics, but now we're talking about the, um, the behavioral adaptations. And so one, one activity around this um, is an adaptation to winter team relay race. And so you just need pictures of the birds with their beaks and two empty containers and students in two teams. And the students will discuss which birds migrate and which adapt. Um, and there's variations on this that you could do, but when the relay begins, then the students have to place the pictures either in the adapt container or the migrate container based on what they presume about the beaks of the birds um, or other physical characteristics that they can see in the pictures. Um, some of them they might know. I mean, they might already be aware, for example, that a hummingbird is a migratory bird. Um, some of them they won't know. It just depends on what pictures you're, you pull from. Um, so I often try to get some that are super familiar, you know, a hummingbird and a chickadee and a blue jay and a crow. And um, to a large extent, although not entirely exact, um, the migratory birds are those birds that have, um, that are all beaks, except for those who can eat meat, um, like a, some of the raptors, some of which migrate, some of which don't. Those for drilling for insects um, and, and those that are cracking seeds. So um, those birds are going to be able to stay here because they can find food. And what what this kind of drills home is that it's it's actually um, uh, if you get into discussion with the kids, it's it's actually not about the temperature um, exactly indirectly it is, but it's really about the caloric intake, how many calories the bird can get to survive. A hummingbird could probably stay here if it could get enough calories to keep itself warm and had a food source. Um, so the, the, the migratory thing is, is about finding food um, so that it has calories so that it can survive. And um, some birds have the adaptations to be able to do that and some don't. And so those birds that are migrating like hummingbirds and um, and uh, I don't know warblers, for example. That you know they they just simply don't have the ability to stay here because their food source is not available. So um, so that's just a little bit of, about the behavioral adaptations as well as the physical adaptations. Um, this would be a relay race you would not be able to do with really young kids. So this would be something you couldn't do with you know the K first graders. Um, but you might be able to 
sort of make you might be able to tweak that idea and um, and you know you could have um, a similar activity that is a relay race with um, you know pictures of birds that have um, see you could just make it more simple birds that are eating meat and birds that are eating seeds you know and then you could have a relay race with those pictures for example or something like that um so in terms of talking about those birds that adapt to the winter they really are pretty extraordinary in what they do um goldfinches grow more feathers lots of birds you know grow more feathers but a thousand i don't know who had to count feathers on a goldfinch but you know a thousand more bird, you know feathers on a goldfinch in the winter than in the summer for example um they change their behavior in terms of what they're eating and how they're eating and where they're eating depending on the species of birds so robins switch from eating invertebrates in the dirt to eating berries sometimes um and they will also do things like eat um, uh, like a little invertebrates in a, in a pool, in a seeping pool of water in a field, for example. Um, chickadees uh, cache food. So they'll make like a pantry and they'll store all their seeds and nuts that they aren't consuming immediately. And they'll put them in a little place that they can find later and, and consume. Um, and that's why their brains grow in the winter and shrink in the summer because they're basically they're making a map um, in their brain. And in order to accommodate that, the brain cells need to increase. So that's sort of extraordinary in the sense that to a large extent, our brains don't really um, have the capacity to, for example, make new cells when once we're an adult. Um, Chickadees and other small birds will also go into torpor at night in the winter time. And chickadees can drop like 20 degrees Fahrenheit in terms of their body temperature. So this is a tricky thing for especially young kids to understand because they don't, you know, you talk to them about, well, when you take your temperature and your internal temperature is, is 97.6 degrees. And then if you take a chicken, so birds all have a temperature, an internal temperature of around a hundred. Um, and so you can talk about it in terms of, you know, in the nighttime there, they can drop their temperature to 80 degrees, but understanding metabolism is something that's obviously really hard for the young kids. They're not gonna grasp that very easily, but um, with the older kids, it is, you know, something that they can understand for sure. So if, you know, if your metabolism is slowing, your heartbeat is slowing, your digestion is slowing, your body temperature is dropping, you're not burning the same number of calories as you would otherwise. And as a result, you don't have to eat as much. Well, um, you know, that's critically important when literally like sometimes if every moment of the daylight and there's less daylight in the wintertime is spent finding your food and consuming it, then it's important to be able to cons conserve those resources um, through the night when it's especially cold. Um, so that, you know, you can talk about it with younger kids and maybe some of them will understand it and some of them won't, but um, it, that is a harder concept. Shivering, it's a great thing because kids do understand that. Most of them have like when they're sick, they have shivered, um, for example, even if they haven't. It's amazing how many people actually haven't ever shivered. <laughs> but um, most of these kids probably have not been uncomfortable enough to shiver, but they have felt it maybe when they have been sick, for example. But birds and other animals will shiver just to get their muscles enough friction to create heat, to be able to um, have enough body heat to keep going. And um, this is a really cool adaptation that rough grouse, they actually grow little nodules on the sides of their toes. And this is um, to increase the surface area of their toes so that when they're walking through the snow, they have wider toes. And so they, we say they grow little snowshoes. Um, the official word is pectination, um, but you can use that word or not as you wish. <laughs> Um, so with respect to migration, a really fun game that we have often played with the kids is migratory hopscotch. Angela's done this too with me. And um, so, you know, you might have the kids make up 
a list of birds that migrate, either things, birds they already know about, or maybe you have them do some research or talk about, you know, well, which birds can find food in the winter time here in Maine and which ones cannot. Um, and so um, it almost matters less that they're correct about this, although you could go and correct them about it, it is as much as just so that they think about, think this through, you know, well, is a duck going to be able to stay here if it's frozen over? No, probably not. Um, could they go to the ocean? Well, it depends on the type of the duck, you know, like loons, which aren't a duck, but, you know, they can go to the ocean and they do find food there. But um, mallards, for example, don't do well in the ocean because they can't they can't find the kind of food they need. Um, so they need to migrate. So if every kid has made up a little card with a migratory bird on it, and maybe they've had a chance to draw the picture or, and do some research on you know, that bird, and then you go outside with them and draw a hopscotch board on the cement with some chalk, and um, the kids all line up on one end, and maybe that end is Maine, and the other end is Costa Rica, and then you, um, maybe all the birds have to fly through, which just means jump through the hopscotch board without touching the lines. And, oh, everybody migrated successfully. That's great. Now we're gonna migrate back from Costa Rica to Maine, but the only problem is um, somebody built a shopping mall or a uh, industrial greenhouse uh, for tomatoes in that place and now there's no habitat for you. There's no perching places at night or no water supply for you. So you can't land there. So you, each of those squares on the hopscotch board um, is a habitat and that habitat that is not available anymore, you just cross it out. So you can just cross it out yourself, just choose a random one um, or you can have the students, one of them could like toss a pebble or a stick or something and whichever where it lands closest to, you just mark it off. Um, usually each round I mark off two, two squares. Now this can get very um, debilitatingly, um, uh, uh, you know, um, disconcerting, let's say, quickly, because quickly the kids will be like, well, what's going to happen to all our habitat or whatever? So I do control kind of what happens there. I don't want the whole um, hopscotch board to be built up and all the birds to not be able to migrate. So I, I do, depending on the age and kind of how the conversation is going, I do kind of control the situation a bit. But um, if you mark off two squares and then all the kids have to migrate through, they do start to understand, well, gosh, there's no, you know, it's harder now because um, they've, they've jumped through, but not quite as many habitats are available to them. Um, and then you go back from Maine to Costa Rica again after maybe marking off two more squares and oh it's a lot harder and maybe there's a section that you really have to like jump over a couple of squares that are adjacent to each other in order to migrate successfully and it gets tricky you know and maybe so when the kids when somebody gets out when they touch a line then I have them read off their card and say oh I'm a ruby throated hummingbird or I'm a um, blue gray gnat catcher and this is a fact about me and this is my picture and that's all I make them do I don't and I sometimes I actually let them get back into the line so they read their card and now that they can get back in the line um, and they can play even though they're not um, you know technically they were just out of the game I suppose, but um, so they can go through again and, and, and you can, um, sometimes I just stop the game when it looks like there's too many habitats getting impacted. <laughs> um, sometimes I say, oh, the government created a law that says no more habitats in this flyway can be um, built up. And so this land is protected forever and the birds can continue to migrate. And it's just a matter of the birds being able to successfully find the habitat. And so then everybody can go through again um, and, and um, successfully migrate, hopefully. So, um, so other ecological concepts that are important that um, you can work into either some of the lessons that we've talked about or um, develop your own activities for. So everything comes at a cost in nature. And one way to get at this is um, to have the kids create game um, board games 
uh, maybe with birds, but other, other things in nature would work too. And there's sort of implications for every action. So you roll the die to move your piece or whatever, and then you have to pull a card and um, the card you know, says something like, oh, um, all your babies survived because you did such a great job feeding them. Um, move forward three spaces or the you know negative card could be like oh you um, you know got uh, didn't get enough food over the course of the season and so now um, you know you're having a hard time surviving winters go back four spaces or something like that so um, I've seen some kids make some really cool board games that way and then um, everything is connected to something else in nature. So there's all sorts of ways to get at that. But you know, talking about it with the kids as you go through conversations, making diagrams, um, integrating how non-living and living aspects of the environment are um, connected to birds in this case would be a great way to get at that. Um, and you could do drawings or dioramas or just talking about it. Um, and then everything goes somewhere, nothing is lost. Well, that's a key one for gardening so um that's a you know that would be cool to be able to sort of tie in decompositions with birds and sort of this nutrient cycling and what that looks like uh in nature and you know what are the nutrients that the plants need and and what's the bird's role in that um and what's the bird's role overall in terms of uh plants and moving plants around and providing pollinator plants for you know moving seeds for pollination um, Buffer areas, for example, would be a key one. Uh, there are lots of opportunities for citizen science with birds, whether it's you know sort of just doing your own science in your own classroom, or being part of something like Project Feeder Watch with Audubon. They have, I'm sorry, with um, the Cornell Lab for Ornithology. This is their website on the left, and on the right is just a chart that I liked. Um, they have all kinds of resources and then there's online data entry that happens so the kids watch birds at a bird feeder on a consistent basis maybe a certain amount of time over um, a long period of time and they enter the data in and it's it's real data that real scientists use to look at bird populations over time so um, you know that you could incorporate that as part of what goes on at the garden for example you could have a a, a feeder station <laughs> and you know it would be augmented by the garden and the seeds that are there and the buffer plants that are there for example and the flowers that are there uh, and then there would be maybe bird feeders and then the kids could do data and and talk about you know contributing to real science that the students are, are um, or scientists are involved with um, and then there's all the sort of general multidisciplinary ideas about making a field guide with art and writing, writing a song, um, that sort of thing. And just always building in observation with, with the science. Uh, and just to make it um, apparent, if it's not already, that we do have resources um, via Zoom um, right now. Someday we'll be in person again. And so, for example, if you were doing something on birds and you wanted us to jump in on some part of it, we'd be happy to, um, you know, doing an introduction or a conclusion or talking about some specific thing with the kids. That'd be easy to do. So you could book us for that. And then um, we have binoculars that are available to borrow. We have field guides that are available to borrow. Uh, and I guess sometimes teachers and other people um, say well how do I really learn the birds so I feel comfortable you know talking about what's out there because I don't really know and the biggest hint I have is put a field guide on the back of your toilet in your house um, because all the really great birders I know that's what they do like if they want to be able to identify what a black throated green warbler looks like as compared to some other warbler they study their books when they're on the toilet and I get that probably is way more information than anybody needs to know but Honest to goodness, I can't tell you how many people I've heard say that. <laughs> so thanks all for joining and uh, appreciate it. Um